Okay, guys, so we're heading towards San Francisco, guys. It's gonna be nice, it's gonna be fun. Because we're talking about the old California, guys. San Francisco is a city, because it's cool. Say what you will about the politics of the region, but it's a very, very cool place. So here we are, Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco. You know we're in San Francisco, because look, traffic. Alrighty guys, so here we are, Golden Gate, San Francisco, the ocean, beautiful sunset. Just before New Year's here too guys, talk a little about the history, the construction, the engineering. Uh, super important bridge guys, I don't really think it needs much of an introduction. International Orange, it's called. So even though it looks red, which it is, the technical name for the color is International Orange. And the man who had the vision for this bridge was Joseph Strauss, although he did not do a lot of the calculations and even the design was changed. Different architect, he came up with the design, but it was Dean Cumbersome. Charles Ellis was a uh, university professor and he did a lot of the calculations for the bridge. Suspension bridge has got two towers, a kilometer and a half long, and the, held up by the towers and the cables that suspend the bridge deck and transfer the forces tension and compression into the ground. What is tension and compression? Well, compression is the, the squeezing force of matter. Something pushing down, the force of gravity pushing down on something is the act of compression. And then tension is pulling, pulling apart. So the bridge is doing two main things here. It's transferring tension and compression. Compression is transferred down through the towers into the piling foundations deep in the bay. This is the underside of it, guys, right now. You can see the foundations, bolted connections. Those two towers on either side of the bridge hold up the entire deck of the bridge and everything on it via those cables. They're attached to the top of the bridge and then to the abutments. On the north side, it goes right into the rock and that is what transfers tension. So these cables hold up the entire deck and as the force moves through the cable, it goes down into the abutment and dissipates. So you have all these little cables holding up the bridge deck attached to the main cables and the main cables are transferring forces into the towers and then these cables coming off of the towers are transferring it back into the abutment. You can see the arch here. That's the iconic arch on the south side. So the compression aspect of it is the tower is holding up the weight of the bridge and the entire weight of the bridge is compressing the foundation. And as it compresses the piles, the piles transfer the compressive forces into the soil below and those deep piling foundations. So you see those piers, those piers are transferring the compressive forces and then the cables that run along the towers and come off into the abutments are dealing with the tension. And then there's shear and torsion as well, but that's more kind of plate connections, uh, beam connections, and torsion is just twisting, right? Which can be compensated for in multiple different ways. So when they designed this, suspension technology was fairly new at the time. So what they wanted to do was devise a system that was safe. So Leon Moisef, a structural engineer, he had done some work pioneering work in suspension cable systems and the physics and design of how a suspension bridge works. And the towers are actually hollow. There are hollow sections inside the towers and they're modular stacked on top of each other. And it gives the bridge that iconic look. But the entire bridge deck, all the cars are supported by the cables and then the cables are supported by the tower and the tower transfers the forces, right? So it's a combination of the cables and the tower that's performing all the work here. Another thing to note, guys, is live loads versus dead loads. So you've got all these cars, foot traffic, trucks, that's live loading. It's, it's active, it's changing. Your dead load is the weight of the tower, the weight of the cables, 
it's the, the dead weight, it's not moving, it stays constant, right? A live load will fluctuate, so let's say you've got 150 cars on the bridge, that'll equate to a certain amount of weight, whereas if you've got 100 cars on the bridge, it works out differently, but in a dead load, it remains constant. The reason this bridge was built, so you can see the area we're in, San Francisco, there's Alcatraz over there, by the way, it's really rugged. So if you wanted to go to like Tiburon from the Presidio, back in the day, in the 30s, before this bridge was built, you would have had to go all the way around, all the way around all of those roads. It took about four or five hours, right? It was a really long trip. It didn't make any sense, and there was tons of traffic, and it was just horrible. So what did they do? They decided, well, let's build a bridge. So they built the bridge across the strait, and it improved the traffic flow immensely, because before that, you had to take the ferries. Like, if you wanted to not have to drive all the way around like four or five hour route. You'd have to take the ferry system and like the San Francisco ferry system is huge guys. We'll talk a little bit about that as well, but you'd have to take the car ferries. But then the problem was is the car ferries were getting all plugged up with traffic because everybody wanted to take the ferry because nobody wanted to do the drive. So then they were like, well, we've got to have more road infrastructure, right? But it was the thirties and they weren't quite there yet. They decided they're going to make it there. So they built the golden gate, Joseph Strauss, his baby. Leon Moisif designed the suspension cable system. He was responsible for suspension cables. So Moisif designed the cable system that holds the deck up that ultimately transfers compression into the tower. And then at the same time, moves the tension into the abutments. And the abutments are the engines of the bridge, right? So you've got north abutment, south abutment. That will transfer the forces into the ground, which is what actually is what allows the bridge to be a functional piece of working infrastructure. Seismic retrofits and historic preservation. Much has been learned about earthquake engineering since the bridge was designed and built in the 30s. Today, mathematical analysis techniques help calculate how a structure will perform when subjected to various levels of ground shaking. In addition, physical tests are run on specimens that represent portions of the structure. Comparing and validating mathematical analysis with test results is a standard engineering method. To test the strength of an existing bridge piece called a lattice strut on the Golden Gate Bridge, a large replica was made and tested by the University of California, Berkeley Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. A piece that had been bent and buckled test specimen is displayed here. With accurate figures for strength of these pieces, decisions can be made to replace or strengthen particular portions of the bridge to preserve it against damage of future earthquakes. Structural engineering, guys. The original lattice struts have a crisscross pattern of many small pieces of steel riveted together. When one of these struts is replaced, the new, stronger, one-piece steel member to be installed has holes cut in it to preserve the historic appearance of the bridge. So, compressive strength, guys. What is compressive strength? Well, once this buckling here, you see this buckling and warping of the steel, this steel has a certain compressive strength for the composition, the quality, um, the alloy of the steel will all determine its strength and ability. And when it buckles like this, this is a, a prime example of compression not being that you have to deal with compression, guys. Earth's crust is broken up into about a dozen large sections called plates. These plates make up the continents and seafloor. They move slowly but steadily over millions of years. At this location, you are standing on the North American plate, the San Andreas Fault. It's about six miles, 11 kilometers away to the west under the ocean. The other far side of the San Andreas Fault is the Pacific Ocean. On a clear day, when you look west over the ocean, you can see the Farallon Islands 30 miles, 48 kilometers away. As strain in the plates builds up and is released, causing earthquakes, the crust on the far side of the San Andreas Fault moves to the right. The Farallon Islands are thus towards Alaska at a rate of about one mile in 40,000 years. If this geologic movement is played backwards, going back about 15 million years, the Farallon Islands would be located in Southern California. Granite is not native to the San Francisco Bay region, but the Farallon Islands are made of granite. Granite made about 400 miles away, 650 kilometers in Southern California and transported here by tectonic movement over that time span. And then there's the Bridge deck aerodynamics. The weight, torsional stiffness, and especially the shape of the cross section of a suspension deck determine the stability of the bridge in strong winds. Importance of cross sectional shape on bridge stability during winds was demonstrated in 1940 when the newly completed Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State collapsed on a moderately windy day, about 40 miles per hour. Torsion, twisting. Torsion is the twisting force, right? So the wind is side loading the bridge deck and it wasn't designed properly. So the torsion forces would just move it back and forth and then it just broke, right? It fatigued 
the material, the steel materials will ultimately suffer fatigue and then break. These models of the bridge decks are equally stocky in cross-section with the same height and width. Because of the small scale of these models, they simulate with some exaggeration the behavior of full-size bridge decks exposed to wind speed of about 10 times greater. For example, when the wind speed here is 5 miles per hour, the models simulate the effect on full-size bridge decks exposed to winds of about 50 miles per hour. Modern bridge deck design and then Tacoma Narrows. You can see how much more it's moving, eh? This is a seismic isolator. And today we know more about earthquakes than we did in the 1930s. When the Golden Great Bridge was being built, taking advantage of this new information, two retrofitted strategies have been used on portions of the bridge to protect against large earthquakes. Strengthening pieces of the bridge to resist forces associated with strong earthquakes and making the bridge more flexible to roll with the punch from an earthquake. Seismic isolators are devices that allow the bridge to move in an earthquake. This movement reduces the forces that the bridge experiences during the earthquake. When a bridge is rigidly connected to the ground, it directly experiences the rapid jerky earthquake shaking. If the bridge is mounted on seismic isolators, the isolators deform back and forth during the earthquake, softening the vibrations that the structure experiences. When a bridge is isolated, the forces can be reduced by as much as two thirds as compared to a non-isolated bridge. Invented in New Zealand in the 1970s, common type of isolator is made of layers of steel and rubber bonded together. Sometimes there is a hole in the middle in which a lead plug is inserted to increase the energy dissipation. So the seismic isolators are black cylinders about three feet in diameter. Structural engineers, guys. They're the ones that would calculate material strengths, uh, how materials are going to respond to all these things. Suction as well, because when you have wind on the towers, you, one side is pushing. And then the others, there's sucks. There's actually suction on the other side. The Golden Gate Strait is the only entrance to San Francisco Bay and is one of the best places in the world to watch ships. So what are some of the ships? Pilot boats, oil tankers, container ships, coast guard vessels, sailboats, tour boats, tugboats, and ferry boats. All various different boats that come through. So let's go look at the isolators, guys, because I wanted to show you, because I was talking about the bearing plates. So you have the columns for the piers, column, cross bracing, beams. So you've got three columns, four pieces of cross bracing, four beams. On top of the column, you've got the isolator, the seismic isolator. And then on top of that, you have the bearing plate for the bridge. And then all those bolted connections are what's actually connecting the bridge. And that's where you're gonna have shear forces a lot, right? Shear is the pushing down on something like that and pushing up. It's the up force and the down force moving together. So it allows the bridge to move. So if the earthquake exerts force on the foundation of the bridge. It's not transferred to the deck and then to the towers and the cables because of the isolation plates. When they first built it, guys, they didn't know any of this, right? This new, new trailblazing stuff that they found out. So pretty big deal. But that's a pretty good rundown of the Golden Gate, guys. I think uh, we did a pretty good summation there. Look at the sunset. Beautiful. Nice warm night in December, San Francisco. Claro. <laughs> hey guys, Sasquatch here. <clears throat> so early in the morning, or decent time in the morning, I guess. Just in Tipper on here, it's San Francisco, across the bay there. Nice rolling hills. So, but we're in Tiburon right now. Really, really nice area, guys. Nice and quiet. Awesome. So, Tiburon Peninsula Historical Trail. The magnificent ferry Kia was built in the Tiburon Railroad yards and launched in January 1891. She could carry 4,000 passengers and 16 loaded freight cars. At 291 feet long and 78 feet wide, she was among the largest ferry boats in the world. Trains rolled in daily, pulled by wood burners and then by oil burning engines and finally by diesels. Spanning 83 years, the last ferry tied up and discharged eight freight cars on September 25th, 1967. Tiburon, the railroad town, retired to a new life. The only building remaining from this photograph was taken in the early 40s is the Donahue Depot, the terminus of the San Francisco and North Pacific Railroad. Its owner, Peter Donahue, was a visionary and fiercely competitive entrepreneur who built this railroad in the 1880s. His crews chiseled out hills, blasted three tunnels, and sunk trainload after trainload of ballast to fill the marshes between here and San Rafael, a monumental accomplishment. A huge framework depicted, known as the gallows frame, lifted the apron and the pier to allow rail cars to be pushed 
onto the waiting ferries headed for San Francisco. These three big wheels now sit in front of our library. Gorgeous though. San Francisco over there. Tiburon on this side. It's really nice here though, guys. We are just on the ferry now, going to San Francisco from Tiburon. San Francisco Bay Ferry System, really important. So we're gonna learn a bit about the ferries and how we get around in this part of the world, right? And they played a huge role in transportation of San Francisco for a long time, guys. Especially before the Golden Gate was built, uh, there was an absolute necessity if you wanted to get anywhere with any kind of means of expediency. Alrighty guys, so we're just turning around right now. So you can see to your right there, that's the Golden Gate. We're going through the bay now. We're gonna go right past Alcatraz. Irving Morrow, guys, he was the architect, designed it. Strauss had it designed initially, but it was deemed cumbersome and some engineers weren't sure if it could be built or not. So Morrow came up with the design that you see here, the modern Golden Gate design. Strauss was kind of the manager of the project itself. Strauss didn't understand as much about bridge building than his peers did, but he was a good commander, right? He was a good manager. And he had division too. San Francisco Bay Ferry System. So this will take you all kinds of different places in the Bay Area, depending on where you want to go. All the bridges here too. Yeah, look at the bridges, guys. It's really cute. Awesome. The famous Alcatraz, guys, that needs no introduction. Alrighty, guys, so we just passed the Golden Gate, Alcatraz, um, and now we're pulling into the, the ferry building. So this is all the gold rush seekers would have done this too, right? Coming around Cape Horn there or the Isthmus and uh, Caribbean, because there's two routes. Take, go from like New York City, all the way down around South America, past Cape Horn there near Chile, and then come back up to San Francisco. And then you would end up in the ferry building. And then from here, you'd be setting out to the gold fields, into the Sierras, go make your pile. And people came from Chile, they came from Hawaii, Mexico, all over guys, all over the world. It's the first big rush, 1849. San Francisco Ferry Building. Port of San Francisco. Just in the Embarcadero right now. Ferry Building. San Francisco Ferry Building. All these little shops and things like that. Look at the architecture though, it's nice. Alrighty guys, so that's gonna be it. It's a pretty cool place, San Francisco. Definitely come check it out one time or another. See you guys on the next one.